Welcome to the Earth Science Lecture, uh, Earthquakes on Part 3. So in the previous two parts of earthquakes in the lecture, we talked about what an earthquake represents, how an earthquake takes place, and we looked at the different kinds of vibrations or seismic waves that's typically released from an earthquake. And then in Part 2, we looked at how to uh, measure earthquakes uh, using the Berkeley scale of intensity, the Richter scale, and the moment magnitude scale. So for part three of earthquakes, we're going to shift gears a little bit, and we're going to look at how earthquake waves or seismic waves provide scientists a look into the Earth's interior. And we start by looking at the different types of body waves, which in particular are the P and the S waves that propagate through the center or through the interior parts of the earth uh, during a major earthquake. And what we find, <clears throat> pardon me, and what we find are seismic waves behave very differently depending on the type of materials that the seismic waves pass through. And so when a seismic waves pass through different types of media, meaning a solid material or a liquid material, uh, what tends to happen is the waves produce what is known as a seismic discontinuity. And a seismic discontinuity is represented by a boundary inside the Earth's interior where the velocity of the wave changes as in addition to the direction of the seismic waves. So again, a seismic discontinuity represents a change in the wave's velocity and direction as it comes in contact with varying types of media, specifically uh, solid and a liquid. There are three waves or three ways that a wave will react as it propagates through the interiors of the earth. One is a wave can be refracted, meaning that the waves are bent as they pass from one material to another. And a really good example of this of refraction is to take a flashlight, for example, and go out to the pool. And uh, as you shine the beam of light from the flashlight into the pool, uh, the beam of light will travel through the atmosphere. And then when it comes in contact with the surface of the water and penetrates the water, the beam from the flashlight is actually refracted or it's bent. And so in fact, the light will actually shine on a different part of the bottom of the pool because of the refracted wave, the bent wave. Uh, seismic waves can be reflected, meaning that waves typically can bounce back. So as the wave propagates through the media and comes in contact with various types of rock formations or interior parts of the earth, the wave is actually reflected back and bounces back to the surface. Uh, the third way uh, waves react as they propagate through the interior parts of the earth is that waves can be absorbed. <coughs> Pardon me waves can be absorbed or blocked or impeded, meaning that as the wave comes in contact with a particular media, the wave can, uh, uh, again, uh, be absorbed and basically dissipate and disappear. <clears throat> so the next slide shows a cutaway view of the Earth's uh, interior. <clears throat> and one thing that I stress in classes and lecture is to be able to um, <clears throat> is to be able to look at a diagram and decipher what that diagram is telling you. As we always said in class, a picture is worth a thousand words. <clears throat> Pardon me. <laughs> so if we look at this diagram here, uh, we want to be able to look at the picture. We want to be able to see uh, what this picture is telling us. So one of the ways to look at that is to uh, view the X and the Y axis and look at the relationship. So if we look at the Y axis here, we find that the Y axis represents the interior parts of the earth at depth in, in kilometers. So for example, we have uh, zero kilometers or at the surface here. And as we uh, work our way down the Y axis, the depth increases to a thousand kilometers, two thousand kilometers and down to the uh, Earth's core of 6,000 kilometers. <clears throat> Pardon me, hang on here. 
Okay, let's try that out and get a little water going on. If we look at the x-axis of the diagram, uh, this is a axis that measures the seismic velocity of the waves at kilometers per second. So we have four kilometers, six, eight, 10, all the way up to 12 kilometers per second. So really what this diagram is showing us is a relationship between depth and the velocity of the particular seismic wave. So what we're gonna do then is let's choose a wave and let's choose the P wave, which is the blue line here. And we're gonna follow this P wave and we're gonna watch uh, what happens to the P wave as it makes its way or propagates to the interior parts of the earth. So if we start here at the very surface, an earthquake takes place, releases the P wave, and you can see right off the bat at the surface, the P wave is already moving at about eight kilometers per second. So as the wave begins to make its way through the interior, um, it goes through the upper mantle. And as you can see, the wave slows down a little bit and the wave speeds up a little bit. And then it comes in contact with the transition zone. And this would mark probably the first seismic discontinuity where you can see that there's an abrupt change in velocity right here. And the wave actually now increases up to about 11 kilometers, or I'm sorry, about nine kilometers per second. And then as the wave propagates through the transition zone, it speeds up and then comes in contact with the um, lower mantle. And as it comes in contact with the lower mantle, it begins to speed up again. And here would be another seismic discontinuity. So by the time it reaches 660 kilometers depth, the wave is already moving about 11 kilometers per second. And then if we watch the wave to continue as it propagates through the lower mantle, it uh, slowly, slowly speeds up and gains velocity, speeds up and speeds up until it gets to about 2,800 kilometers in depth below the Earth's surface. And by this time, the wave is moving along pretty close to about 13 and a half kilometers per second. And all of a sudden, it hits about the 2,900 kilometer mark. And what happens to the P wave? It makes an abrupt slowdown. And that abrupt slowdown goes all the way down back to eight kilometers per second. So here at about 2,900 kilometers in depth, um, we have a, a major seismic discontinuity. And the wave, again, slows way down uh, to eight kilometers. So it slows, the velocity slows way down. And this is kind of analogous to, um, to uh, uh, folks, for example, uh, running as fast as you can and then coming in contact and running into a big vat of jello. And basically what's gonna happen if you hit that vat of jello, you're gonna slow way down. So the question is what caused the P wave then to have this abrupt uh, uh, discontinuity? Well, it came in contact with a liquid. And in this case, it was the outer liquid core. And so the wave begins to uh, uh, propagate, move through the outer liquid core and slowly begins to uh, increase in its velocity. And it gets down to a little over 5,000 kilometers below the Earth's surface. And then right here, there's another abrupt velocity change where the wave increases in velocity and now it traverses through the inner core which is now solid. So right here where my arrow is uh, shows another um, seismic discontinuity. And so what we've kind of gleaned from this, uh, um, this graph or this uh, diagram is that again as waves propagate and move through different media meaning a liquid uh, or a um, solid, the wave will have a tendency to change its velocity depending on if it hits a liquid or if it hits a, um, a solid, again, defining various seismic discontinuities. Let's try the S wave. So we'll come up here to the green line, which is, represents an S wave. So again, the earthquake takes place. Uh, the S wave comes out of the chute at about five kilometers per second. We would expect that because it should be a little bit um, less velocity than the P wave. And again, the S wave slows down. It enters the transition zone. So there's a seismic discontinuity there. It uh, increases in velocity to another seismic discontinuity. And then again, it picks up a little velocity as it uh, propagates and makes its way through the lower mantle. 
and then it hits the another transition zone between the lower mantle and an outer liquid core and a slight uh, increase in a discontinuity there and then all of a sudden it hits the outer liquid core and what happens to the s wave it immediately goes to zero or in other words because we know that s waves do not travel through liquid but only travel through solids the s wave is absorbed and um, dissipates in the liquid outer core and so again the point here is that um, humans have never been down down to the very depths of the uh, interior parts of the earth but scientists can decipher the uh, layering of the interior of the earth just by looking at the behavior of seismic waves in particular the p and the s wave so a couple terms we come up here to the um, upper part of the mantle and uh, we notice a little decrease or drop in velocity on both waves uh, this is known as the Mohovric discontinuity, or sometimes referred to as the Moho. And it makes up a part and section of the asthenosphere. And we learned in plate tectonics that the rigid segmented plates on the Earth's lithosphere rides along this area of the asthenosphere. And so, again, this is evidenced by the decrease in velocity, and typically the Moho and asthenosphere uh, react very ductily, react malleably, and so it's kind of, and I'm going to use the unscientific word, gooey. And then you notice that the um, both waves, the S and the P wave, pick up in velocity, and this is marked by the mantle, and the mantle represents very highly compressed rock. It's a little more dense, and typically uh, being more dense, it allows the velocity uh, to speed up um, a little bit and we can certainly see that in the p and the s wave so i think what students should take home um, from this diagram is to not necessarily memorize or learn everything on the diagram but more to interpret the diagram because i certainly can anticipate that this diagram will show up on the exam and i don't think one again has to memorize if you learn how to interpret the diagram uh, you should be able to uh, um, glean any type of answers uh, from the various types of questions that I may present uh, based on this diagram. This slide now is, represents another cutaway of the Earth, but this time we've cut the entire um, um, Earth in half, and so it exposes the mantle, the outer core, uh, the inner solid core. And what we're going to do is we're going to watch um, um, the body waves, in, in particular the P and the S wave, propagate through the interior of the Earth, and we're going to watch how these waves behave um, as they uh, encounter uh, from a solid uh, to a liquid. So for example purposes, we're going to demonstrate a large earthquake, right where the arrow is shown here, and we're going to pretend that this is an eight magnitude type earthquake, so the body waves um, will uh, be projected uh, through the interior parts of the Earth. So let's just follow uh, um, the uh, green line, which I think is representative of the P wave. And we watch a P wave, and as the P wave propagates through, through the mantle, interior parts of the Earth, uh, seismograph stations uh, will be picking up um, the wave, um, both the S and the P wave on this side of the Earth, and certainly on this side of the Earth. But we watch the P wave coming down uh, here where my arrow is. Um, in fact, let's do this P wave. The P wave is coming down here where my arrow is. What happens to the wave when it moves from the solid mantle and encounters the, um, 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 the blue area, which is the uh, outer liquid core? And the wave will have a tendency to refract. So we can use that term here, refracting or bending. And it changes its direction because now it's um, propagating and moving through a liquid then as the p wave uh, comes out of the outer core liquid outer core it refracts again because this time it's entering the solid from a liquid and then seismograph stations pick it up here at the surface of the earth and what's interesting and important to note is because of that refraction of the p wave um, um, coming out of the um, liquid outer core 
it leaves what we call a 40 degree arc of no P and S waves detected. And so typically when there is a major earthquake and P and S waves propagate through the interior, um, wherever that earthquake um, um, takes place, there'll always be a 40 degree arc somewhere on the earth uh, that tells you that there's uh, the absence of both P and S waves. So in this case, the earthquake was here. So we have a 40 degree arc on this side of the earth and we have a 40 degree arc on this side of the earth. If the earthquake took place here where my arrow is, we'd more likely get a 40 degree arc over here and a 40 degree arc over here, which again represents the absence of both P and S wave. That absence of P and S wave along this 40 degree arc is known as the shadow zone. And so typically the shadow zone will always occur somewhere on earth depending on where the earthquake takes place and from the shadow zone and given the 40 degree arc and some geometry it's very easily then to calculate the precise diameter of the outer liquid core so when you read in your textbook especially in chapter one and they give dimensions on how uh, wide or the diameter of the outer liquid core it's very reasonable because again it's based on seismic activity uh, on the earth and it's based on how the P and S waves propagate through the interior parts of the earth. And then of course, um, if the earthquake um, located here takes place, then you would expect on the opposite side of the earth that you would have the absence of S waves and only um, detect P waves because what happens to the S waves? And you should be saying, well, the S waves are being absorbed in the liquid outer core. This slide represents um, uh, the process or what happens in terms of what causes a tsunami. And by definition, a tsunami represents an uh, enormous type ocean wave uh, created from an earthquake or an undersea volcanic eruption, for example. And really what this is saying is that tsunamis occur um, in the ocean if water, if the volume of water is being displaced. So for example, uh, an undersea volcanic eruption, if the eruption is uh, large enough, you know, voluminous amounts of uh, lava and extrusive rocks can pour out from the volcano um, fill in, fill the ocean floor, which displaces a particular amount of water, which certainly could be the cause of a tsunami. But probably what's more common for the creation of a tsunami is uh, the activity of an earthquake. So if we come down to this diagram in your lower part of your slide, we see that uh, if we look at the ocean floor where my arrow is, so here's the ocean floor, there's an ocean floor, and in this case, this ocean floor has dropped downward with respect to this part of the ocean floor. And basically that leaves an underwater void. And you can see in the diagram that the water will rush and to fill in this displacement um, or this void. And really what it creates is an underwater uh, waterfall. And so as this water then fills in the void because of the um, earthquake that was generated by this dropping ocean floor block here, water on the shoreline will have a tendency to pull way out and to fill in this void. And what's typical in a tsunami, if you're on the coastline, because of that ocean filling in that void, um, typically the shoreline will pull way, way back. And that's a sure, sure sign that a bigger wave is gonna be coming back in because once this void is filled, water uh, will uh, reach an equilibri equilibrium and move back onto shore. And typically it moves back onto shore uh, with a vengeance. And so a little uh, story um, that I have, and I've, I've read a little bit when um, uh, the tsunami or when the uh, 2004 Sumatra earthquake took place, there was an earthquake on the ocean floor um, about where my arrow is. And we know that uh, during that earthquake, the uh, eastern coast of India was inundated with a huge tsunami. And so one of the stories I read 
um, um, deals with a, uh, um, um, a little girl uh, who's from the United States and her family were vacationing in India because I believe it was the 24th of um, December at the time. So it was vacation time, Christmas time. And uh, as the earthquake took place and these uh, family, the folks were vacationing on the shoreline of India, the water receded uh, way out uh, several miles. And at that point, many people got up from their lawn chairs and, and um, the beach area and began to uh, walk out on the ocean floor to kind of um, um, explore. And of course, uh, when the wave came back in, those folks really were never heard of again. But this little girl from the United States uh, noticed that the um, wave uh, went way out and warned her family that, hey, I think a tsunami is going to happen and we need to uh, find higher ground. And so the family just kind of looked at her bewilderedly, but they listened and uh, the family found higher ground. And sure enough, uh, the little girl was was correct. And so they asked the little girl later, uh, and again, she was in elementary school. They asked her a little bit later how she knew. And she said, well, a couple of weeks before we took our vacation, um, we were taught about tsunamis and what to look for. And I thought this was interesting because, wow, the power of education uh, saved, that, uh, saved that family. These uh, dotted lines uh, that I put on the, uh, on the map here, uh, I made these lines up so they're not that accurate. But really what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that these lines represent timelines. So this could be one hour, two hours, three hours, and this would be four, five, six, and so forth. And really what I'm indicating is that once the wave is generated, uh, the waves uh, will move across the entire, um, entire ocean. And what's interesting is if you take a look at the island here off of um, Africa, which is Madagascar, you find that as the waves come in contact with Madagascar, they're actually bent and they move around the Madagascar. And really the other term we can use besides bent, we could say that the waves have been refracted. And so the re waves refract and bend around Madagascar. So again, I wanted to bring this slide up to kind of educate folks in terms of really what causes a tsunami and why typically uh, there's tsunamis, you know, could be tsunamis after a earthquake out in the ocean floor. Well, the last part of the discussion of earthquakes deal with can earthquakes be predicted? And really at this time, earthquakes cannot successfully be predicted. Meaning in other words, um, there really isn't uh, prediction um, methods out there that allow a person to say an earthquake is gonna happen at uh, 10.05 on this particular day. Um, it's not gonna happen. That type of prediction is, is, not, uh, uh, is not out there. But really, in order to predict an earthquake, uh, science folks who make the predictions uh, must have a very small range of uncertainty as to the location and the timing. Because if you think about it, if you keep predicting earthquakes and they don't happen, uh, then it becomes more of a cry wolf uh, situation. And then once an earthquake really is going to happen and it was predictable, uh, not many folks in society um, will uh, be able, you know, will believe it. And so predictions must be able to produce few, few failures and uh, certainly no false alarms. So in terms of earthquake prediction, uh, geologists have used the Sandreas Fault um, as kind of a, um, um, you know, kind of an area to, to explore earthquakes and make predictions and have done many studies along the Sandreas Fault. And so predictions of earthquake at this point is really based on uh, probability. In other words, uh, what are the chances of an earthquake. And when we say probability, it's very, it, it really boils down to a statistical estimation of when an earthquake is going to take place um, over, you know, a, a given time. So what one observes is the frequency of earthquakes and looks for what we call gaps in the seismic record. And so really the latest type of prediction for earthquakes is using a process called the seismic gap method. And if we take our example on the San Andreas Fault, uh, again, we look at the San Andreas Fault and it traverses to the southern part of California and then the eastern side of Los Angeles. And there's a little kink right up in here where my arrow is, which is around the grapevine area. 
And then here's, of course, Bakersfield and Trave Tra um, traverses through the Carrizo Plain and then out through the Bay Area uh, in San Francisco. And so when we look at the seismic gap method for predictions of earthquakes and we use the studies along the San Andreas Fault, what we find is that there's been a fair amount of earthquake activity in the southern portion of the San Andreas Fault. And there's been a fair amount of earthquake activity and frequency of earthquakes on the northern part of the San Andreas Fault. However, in the Carrizo Plain area of the San Andreas Fault, uh, seismic activity is very, very low to none. And in fact, the last earthquake uh, that was experienced in this area was the Fort Tejon earthquake in the uh, 1857, um, I believe, 1857, the Fort Tejon earthquake. And there really hasn't been any seismic activity since. So we would say then from a statistical point, that there is a gap of seismic activity. And in order uh, for the San Andreas Fault to, to uh, um, be stable, it has to be in some type of equilibrium by uh, actually moving every once in a while. But because it hasn't moved uh, for over 100 years now in the Carrizo Plain, uh, that uh, increases the probability of a major earthquake in that area. So again, the absence of earthquakes or the gap, and that's where the seismic gap method comes in, the gap in earthquakes, uh, will have a tendency to, uh, to increase um, uh, the chances for an earthquake. So when we look at this map, um, this is a map um, that shows um, seismicity or earthquakes uh, over the state of California. And the last, uh, the last, um, um, this is a screenshot of earthquake activity in California uh, in October of 2018. And certainly these little uh, squares, these colored squares indicate earthquake activity. And you can come over here and look at the legend. And of course the colors indicate the time, yellow is uh, last week, uh, blue last day. And then of course the red is just the last hour. And then the size of each one of the uh, squares indicate the type of magnitude. So if you kind of take a general look at this map, you certainly see again, uh, you have earthquake activity in the southern part of the San Andreas Fault. You have earthquake activity in the northern part of the San Andreas Fault. But again, you look in the Carrizo Plain area right in here, and there is a gap of seismicity uh, taking place along this part of the Carrizo Plain San Andreas Fault. So based on the gap, uh, and based on the fact that the San Andreas Fault hasn't moved in that area for over 100 years, seismologists and geophysicists predict the probability of a major earthquake. So, of course, in um, the southern part of the San Andreas Fault, it's a 30% chance of a major earthquake, which is low because there's been lots of seismic activity. And then in the northern area of the fault, there's a 10% chance. Again, there's a lot of seismic activity that kind of takes the stresses off of the um, San Andreas Fault. But here in the central portion of the San Andreas Fault, it is now um, um, looked at as a 90% chance of a major earthquake, uh, more than likely eight magnitude or better. And again, uh, that's because of the lack of earthquake activity that's been taking place uh, over the last 100 years. Now, some seismologists and geophysicists believe that this part of the San Andreas Fault is basically locked up because of the little, what they call the kink in the San Andreas Fault right here. And this is right over the grapevine. So as you travel over the grapevine, uh, you come across a little kink in the San Andreas Fault because remember, uh, the North American plate is moving to the south and the um, Pacific plate is moving to the north and right in here, it's a little, it's locked up. It's not been able to move. So a lot of uh, seismologists believe that in this area, uh, lots and lots of stress is being um, added to that area with a lot of deformation. And this should now start to be sounding a lot like the elastic rebound theory. So more and more stresses are, are happening and it's building and building. And at one, at some point, it's not if, but it's when the San Andreas Fault is going to uh, decide to move. And of course, when it moves, 
um, you know, Bakersfield, Los Angeles, San Diego, the Bay Area, this whole section of, of California certainly is going to uh, uh, feel that earthquake. Oops, let me go here. So this diagram here is an animation of what um, it would look like um, as an earthquake taking place along the Carrizo Plain in the San Andreas Fault. And so before I play the, uh, the video, let's kind of uh, look at a couple of um, um, observations on this map. Uh, first, of course, here's Los Angeles here. Um, here's Santa Barbara in the West Coast. There's Bakersfield there. This is the San Andreas Fault right here. And so as it kind of uh, traverses east of Los Angeles, uh, here would be the grapevine area. So this is the little kink area of the San Andreas Fault. And then it traverses a pretty linear um, 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 north uh, in the Carrizo Plain uh, area. And so when you watch this video, think about um, um, what uh, how an earthquake reacts in terms of the vibrations. And in fact, think about going all the way back to the very uh, first part of the discussion, part one um, of earthquakes, and think about that rock being thrown into the small pond because the video is going to allow a, a high magnitude earthquake to take place right here in the Carrizo Plain where we would expect that given the fact that it hasn't moved for over 100 years and in fact there's a 90% probability. So I'm going to go ahead and push the button and play the video. Maybe we'll do it a couple times. Whoops. Here it goes. So boom, earthquake. And you can kind of see the uh, propagation of the waves uh, moving across the state. Uh, again, kind of like that throwing the pebble into the pond. And you can see clear down to San Diego they're certainly feeling the effects. All right. Let's watch it again. And here we go. Boom, earthquake. And you can kind of see like somebody took a carpet and kind of shaking the carpet out. Okay, yeah, let's just get back here. Yeah. Well, it's not letting me switch slides here. Well, Okay, well, it's not uh, letting me uh, switch slides. I'm gonna try it one more time here. And uh, it's not let me do it. So actually, I only had one more slide left that again, uh, looks at the San Andreas Fault. But I think at this point, I think you get the idea. And uh, this will conclude the um, um, Earth Science slash Geology Lecture for Earthquakes.